Grazie. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Okay, the first speaker of the afternoon, uh, Andrea Ocar from uh, the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He's going to talk about solar and terrestrial neutrinos with Boraxin. Thank you, Eric. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's my second time in Mexico. And so, yeah, I'll be focusing my talk uh, following uh, some instructions on a pretty unique experiment that is still running and it's been doing measurements on neutrinos from the sun across the entire uh, spectrum of the neutrinos emitted. This is not the only experiment that has measured the neutrinos from the sun, or at least some of them, uh, but it has done so in, a, in, a, in its own special way. So following a path of my talk, uh, I'll be introducing solar neutrinos and, um, and how, they, uh, how they fit into the neutrino oscillation history a little bit. Uh, but then I will be focusing on, on, the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the drivers of, uh, of, of this experiment um, and, and, and try to highlight the challenges, not, not, for, not to be te 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 tedious about the details, but to, uh, to highlight how one would, would uh, go about doing the, this kind of experiment. Uh, I'll be talking about results, obviously, which are interesting, neutrinos, from data in phase one and phase two. This is a, an experiment that has been on since 2007, and so we have plenty of data, and we have in, introduced plenty of upgrades, uh, both in the hardware and in the uh, analysis. Uh, but we also have been able to do uh, uh, parasitic types of measurements, which are actually quite interesting in, in and of themselves, neutrinos from the Earth, geoneutrinos. Uh, I'll be mentioning something either today or maybe tomorrow about neutrino magnetic moments, and I'll be saying a few things about astrophysics beyond the sun uh, that we have been able to do. This is probably not competitive with uh, some other uh, bigger experiments. However, uh, they might have their own uh, little pieces of interest uh, for some of you in the audience. Uh, I will be spending some time on phase three because uh, these neutrinos, as I'll try to explain, the CNO uh, uh, neutrinos are very subdominant in the in the sun. They're about one percent of the of the of the neutrinos emitted in the sun. Uh, and so one might ask, why are they interesting? Well, they're interesting because they tell us about the meta, the, the, amount, the the contents of metals in the sun. And metal is anything above helium. So. Uh, it tells us about the history of the sun, it tells about uh, planet formation, and so there are some practical interests uh, in these. And this is the dominant fusion cycle, as I'll try to explain, in larger stars. And now I'll be talking about a project that we'll do next year with a source to try and uh, maybe put a lid or maybe discover something in the sterile neutrino sector. But first of all, I'm in Mexico, and Gran Sasso, which is where 
uh, we run our experiment has witnessed the last earthquakes uh, in history and one not so, f so long ago. And so I would just like to sympathize with the population here uh, for the earthquake that has hit uh, not so long ago. And, and this is a picture I took not, not much after the date of the earthquake. And it tried to express hope and growth uh, for the future. Uh, some history of neutrinos, I won't go through the whole thing, but just to say, here I summarize why neutrinos have been important in history. And neutrinos from the sun actually appear relatively early in the game, the theoretically, and then exper uh, from experiment. And they've been a very important picture in, in, in what we know about neutrinos today, which is really a sector that has brought new physics. And so it's really important to, 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 to remember how long it really took for certain ideas to, 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 to cement. And research nowadays on neutrinos are both precision, the, the physics, uh, research on neutrino mass, sterile neutrinos, uh, and other uh, numerous things that neutrinos can be the probes of. And then there are numerous sources of neutrinos, and the history is actually quite interesting. The very first experiments to detect the existence of a neutrino was proposed to detonate a nuclear bomb underground and then put a detector not far away and detect neutrinos. That never happened, but just to see how crazy uh, ideas have a scientific substance and then sometimes are not practical. And then historically, neutrinos were observed at reactors, but as we know now, we've been observing neutrinos from a variety of sources, uh, which uh, are, are things I won't cover in detail. So let me switch to the sun. So the sun bur uh, is burning protons into uh, helium. Uh, and so the grand uh, reaction is, is, is this. So as protons get eat, eaten up, a certain amount of helium is produced. And this goes on for a long, long time. The sun now is in its equilibrium phase. And it's going to be so for a long time. And neutrinos are emitted at all these places where you see the red symbol in this uh, so-called PP chain, which is due to beta. Um, uh, he wrote his theory in 1939. Uh, so this is, uh, this is humbling in many ways. Uh, it's, a, it's a long time ago. This is classical physics nowadays. And so there's neutrinos emitted in, in two different ways. Sometimes the neutrino is the result of a capture of an electron, like a barium-7. And so the neutrino that come, comes out is, has a defined energy, because the decay is a two-body decay. Other times, like the fusion of protons into a deuteron, a positron, and a neutrino, defines a continuous spectrum of the neutrino. And I'm saying all this because I will be showing data that basically show all this and, and, and how we go about detecting these neutrinos. Now, from basic physics, we know that fusions of protons can actually also occur in a medium that has a lot of electrons via the reaction of two protons plus an electron fusing into the same pro products, a neutrino and a deuteron. In this case, the neutrino that comes out has a rate that's much suppressed, but it uh, has a very defined energy. And that makes it easier to detect, as I'll say. Going to the CNO cycle, this is a catalytic process that involves carbon-12, nitrogen, oxygen, and, and fluorine, in fact, which is not here. It's another cycle, uh, into making the same process occur. So these heavy elements don't get consumed in the sun. They don't fuse, but they facilitate the fusion of, of, of uh, 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 protons into, into helium. And John McCall and others have now, from a, from a long time ago, uh, figured out uh, the model of the sun uh, that allows to fit all the solar data that, from light and from helioseismology and from what we, we know and see about the sun and making assumptions about equilibrium of the sun. Where in the sun these fusion processes occur is towards the center of the sun and at what rate given the density the sun has to have to have the temperature we observe and so on and so forth. And you can see here that there's neutrinos with a continuous energy spectrum, like PP and B8. Neutrinos with mono, with a defined energy, like the barium-7 and the PP. And they span an energy of, you know, about uh, 15 MeV. Uh, so the, the, this is what we expect, we expected uh, from, neutr from neutrinos from the sun. 
This is a picture that, of course, has iteratively improved over time. And Ray Davis and John McCall uh, were really pioneers in this because they decided, uh, following ideas from Alvarez and others, to, to do a crazy thing, to say, well, the neutrinos don't interact much. At that point, it was clear they, they follow the weak interaction, and so their cross-section is, 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 is pretty small. And so in order to detect any number of neutrinos you can actually count, you need a target that's large. And large was several hundred tons. And they had a very smart idea. Now, they realized that at these energies, there's a lot of background that can sneak in. So they realized that one thing they had to do was to go underground. Because there's a lot of products that look like beta decays that are the product of cosmic ray interaction. And so shielding is the first thing one has to do. And so you go deep underground. This is in the Homestake mine in South Dakota. And then they use nuclear physics uh, to look for this, re this reaction. This was a, a tank of 400 tons of cleaning fluid um, that contained a lot of chlorine 37. And you can have neutrino capture on chlorine 37. In order for this reaction to happen, the neutrino has to have electronic uh, uh, type, or to, to be of electronic type. And then you produce atom by atom a certain amount of argon 37. That's a radioactive decay. It decays with a very low energy uh, uh, with a lifetime of the order of a month. And the cross section is such, was the, the prediction was to produce you know, an atom every couple of days in a tank of 400 tons. And then they would sift through with a purge of gas and extract these gaseous argon atoms and then put them in counters and count the x-rays from these atoms. A crazy idea in the 60s. Um, and uh, not only did they claim a measurement of neutrinos from the sun, proving that the sun is burning through fusion, but they went beyond. And they, you know, they said, our model, due mainly to John Bacall, would have told us that we would have had to see three times as many. And this is an experiment that ran two decades. And so they stuck to their one-third of the expected flux for a long time. We now, today, know this is correct. But for the longest time, everybody would say, well, do you really understand the sun up to a factor of three? Do you really understand your cross-section to a factor of three? Do you really understand your systematics? Do you really understand the combination of all these to a factor of three? And the, the result is, yes, this was actually spot on. So this is, a, this is really interesting. You count atoms in tons of detectors. Um, so the chlorine experiment was sensitive to neutrinos above this uh, energy. But really, they were mostly, uh, because of an enhancement of the cross-section at high energy, uh, sensitive to the B8. So they were sensitive to this high energy tail of the neutrino spectrum. This is a large scale. So this is a one neutrino every like 10,000 in the sun. So it's a, they, they actually made that claim based on a very small fraction. Other experiments came by, and the water Chernkov experiments, Kamlokhand and Super K, and then also Snow, um, came along. And um, as, as, as far as the neutrino scattering off electron channel uh, what, 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 uh, what, what was concerned, they can only see the very high energy tail because in order to produce a Chernkov signal in, a, in, 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 in water, they, they, the electron scattered had to have enough energy. And again, they saw a deficit, but not quite the same. Okay? Then another similar experiment to the chlorine experiment, the gallium experiments came by using a similar process on gallium uh, with a low energy threshold that made them sensitive to these abundant PP neutrinos. And again, they saw a deficit, but not quite a third. They saw a half. And this went on, uh, so the chlorine experiment ran in the early 70s and late 60s. Kamlo uh, Khan, the late 80s, the uh, Super K, and, the, the, and these experiments ran in the 90s. So this was a conundrum that lasted for decades. And, and then we came along, uh, well, it's actually before I joined the collaboration, with a proposal of a, of a real-time experiment that would be sensitive to most of the spectrum with a very low threshold, but would be able to detect neutrinos event by event, contrary to these sort of integration experiments where the, you expose a target and then you count how many atoms were made, but you didn't know exactly at, at what time it was made. So uh, originally designed to solve the solar neutrino puzzle by trying to detect the beryllium-7 flux that was predicted from a model of the sun that didn't fit all the deficits from all these experiments, and I can't go into the detail of exactly why I'm happy to answer a question about this. 
Um, but the detection of the beryllium-7 flux would have, you know, they didn't fit in the, in, the, in the total sum of all the other experiments unless new physics was at play, which we, we now know is true with neutrino oscillations. Uh, but in the meantime, Super-K and Snow established that neutrinos actually oscillate. So Super-K with atmospheric neutrinos in 98, Snow in 2001 with a seminal experiment uh, on, on neutrinos from the sun, uh, unambiguously determine the flavor uh, transformation of neutrinos from the production point to the detection. Uh, and so uh, we uh, uh, continued. Uh, we still thought uh, we, we were uh, a good experiment to run. But the scope was, yes, to, to, to prove the neutrino oscillations and confer them, but also to go beyond and really try to do precision uh, physics with them and then to study the sun. And at this point, if you understand the neutrinos, you can actually say, okay, now I am a telescope for, for the sun. And this is exactly what we have done now for a decade. We celebrated a decade in September, in fact. And in order to succeed, I anticipate, and I'll try to motivate it uh, extensively, that uh, we have become the standard against which low energy rare event experiments milestone their radioactivity the goals. Uh, but before let's celebrate uh, the discovery of super K with oscillations in atmospheric neutrinos and the, 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 the discovery of the snow experiment, uh, Mark Chen is in the audience, uh, uh, which uh, clearly measured the electronic component of the solar neutrino flux at about a third of the expected one. And then the, 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 the flavor blind uh, process told us that we're actually seeing all the neutrinos expected from the sun. So this, this was a success in neutrino physics, low background physics and solar physics at the same time. Uh, neutrinos oscillate, mass states are not the flavor eigenstates. And we now know from a, a number of experiments, solar accelerator reactor, um, uh, and so on, experiments that neutrinos oscillate and the mixing angles are actually quite well uh, known and the differences in the masses that are needed in order for oscillations to occur are, are measured quite precisely. And so far, nobody, you know, everybody has been refining these numbers. Uh, as far as the sun goes, there's a prediction that because the sun is a dense medium um, and neutrinos traverse uh, uh, dense ma material in the, in the sun, there's a, a very well predicted uh, energy dependence of how many neutrino electronic flavor convert by the time they leave the sun and then uh, reach us. And so there is actually a prediction that t tells us that at high energy you should see a suppression to about a third, and at low energy you should see about a half. And try to remember the gallium and the chlorine experiment saw exactly that. And, and so it wasn't just imprecision in the measurement, it was, a, it was actually physics as it's turning out to be. Uh, okay, so uh, the, bo bo the, bo the Borxene experiment is a 300 ton target of liquid scintillator made as clean and pure as possible and clean from radioactivity. Any radioactivity looks like a low energy neutrino interaction that scatters off electrons which is the process by which we detect uh, neutrinos from the sun or neutrinos from anywhere. We are under a mountain, but the mountain actually looks like this. Uh, this is uh, the, the peak of the range, and the, the lab is not exactly below the peak, but anyway, it's, it's, it's pretty close. And there's a, a highway tunnel that goes under, and the lab is off the highway tunnel. When neutrinos come in, sometimes, rarely, they interact and kick, give a little bit of kinetic energy to the electron. That electron in the scintillator produces a flash of light. We can detect the flash of light and do two things with the light. Count the number of photons, that's a measure of energy of, of the electron. And we can do a time of flight detection to all the PNTs that surround this transparent uh, ball of scintillator and reconstruct where the event has occurred. And depending a little bit on the energy, we can reconstruct events to about five uh, centimeters or, or 10, depending on, on the energy and how much light they produce. So the timing of the PMTs is crucial. And the other thing that's crucial, you see that this detector looks exactly like an onion, very, very much like the snow experiment does. So the scintillator is contained in a thin nylon balloon. 
Why thin? Well, because everything is dirtier than the scintillator. And so you want to minimize any material that's not the fluid that is the active detector. And then, and then you fill the volume between the scintillator and the outside with a similar fluid that where, where we have quenched the, the, the light uh, in order not to be sensitive to the radioactivity emitted from the steel of this big sphere and from the PMTs, which by and large are the hottest things uh, anywhere close to the detector. There's another little bag, a thin bag in between, and this is sort of a, a wall for radon. I, I don't want to say too much about this unless there's questions. Uh, it's something I've worked on a lot, but uh, basically if radon is emitted at the periphery, this gives it a barrier that it, it diffuses through on the time scale it has to decay. And so it will never get to the center of the detector. So the name of the game is then to define the cleanest possible target in the middle of the detector. And typically we have to apply a software cut because the event's too close to this balloon. The balloon is super clean, but what, even if it's clean, it's not as clean as the scintillator that is needed to do neutrino uh, observations. Now to give you an idea of the cross section and the weight, in the central 100 tons, which is roughly speaking what we, we use for a lot of our analyses, uh, we see several tens of neutrino events a day. So this is kind of the rate that we have. And then everything is dangerous. Neutrons from the rock need to be shielded. Gamma rays from everything else have to be shielded. Alpha radioactivity, beta activity in the scintillator, on the periphery, there's radon. Cosmic rays, very suppressed, but still a few can shower and make some radioactivity that then lives minutes or a few hours and, 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 and can be a background. So before the experiment could be finally approved, a four ton uh, prototype was run before I joined. And it reached a milestone of determining that A, the carbon-14 abundance in scintillator, scintillator is made of carbon, so carbon-14 is part of it. But because carbon-14 is a beta emitter, and it's what allows us to, do, to date objects, and I'm sure the museum here has, has used this technique uh, uh, on some of their stuff, uh, beta decays are bad, so they cover the neutrino events. And, but the pseudocumene used as a solvent for the scintillator it came from petroleum that was underground for a very long time, much longer than the decay time of carbon-14. And we measured a few parts in 10 to the 18 as a topic abundance. By and large, this is still the the determining the trigger rate of the experiment. So something at the level of 10 to the minus 18 is determining the trigger rate of the experiment. This is how rare the events we want to look at are. And then we did another thing, the radioactivity that's in everywhere at about a part in a, in a million if you, you know, of uranium and thorium was measured after some purification to be reducible to one part in 10 to the minus 16. This was a factor of a thousand better than anyone had done at that time, and this is the 90s. So anyway, this was demonstrated on the ton scale, the experiment goes ahead. All sorts of precautions were taken. This is the purification plant uh, at Princeton prior to being shipped to Grand Sasso. These are uh, techniques used in the petrochemical industry to purify um, solvents. And uh, you can see how these were assembled in a clean room, uh, and all these parts were precision cleaned by a company close to NASA that does these precision cleaning for satellites and, and, and things like that. Uh, because any impurity, any speck of dust uh, that could go into the detector was, was dangerous. Then we filled the detector with trucks delivering this PC. Some of it we stored, some of it we, we, we sent through, through a distillation column. We did nitrogen stripping, which is another technique to remove radon and gases from, uh, uh, from, uh, from, from liquids. And we filled the detector. And we filled the, vo the volumes, all three at the same time, because the, the vessels here are not structural, they're just bags. Think of a shopping bag. And so we had to keep the levels uh, constant, and we did this with these pressure uh, gauges. Um, I've been kicked out. I'll try again. The balloons were produced at Princeton. This is me. This is Bacall. Um, <laughs> I had to put it in. I was a student back then. And the reason, so these were made like an orange 
set of, uh, of, 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 of PO sectors glued together into two spheres, nested one into the other, folded over, shipped to Gran Sasso. And every day, we spent a year in here. This table is long. You can see how long this table is. Um, and uh, every day, we would bag, cover everything, because the daughters of radon otherwise would deposit on the plastic. And then when you fill it with scintillator, they wash off and go into the liquid. And um, the air in the clean room was suppressed. And this is something I worked on. I built the first filter of this kind coupled to clean room. This is one of the areas that actually now are commonplace. Every lab on the ground has a radon suppressed clean room. Uh, and there's actually a company that builds them. <laughs> so um, I didn't patent it, so uh, too bad. Then we filled the detector. Right? Before we put the scintillator in, we filled it with uh, uh, the water fill. And Snow Cross is, is doing exactly the same thing. Uh, I like to show these pictures because, first of all, they're fascinating pictures, um, taken with cameras inside. Second, you do a lot of optics. Uh, this, uh, this is the South Pole reflected on the interface. And then you have all these membranes and so on. So this is sort of a camera underwater or above above water, probably, or maybe halfway. Probably the level is on the dome. And then you can do all the refractions that you want. Anyway, I, I like to show it to, stu to students to figure out uh, the image. Then we displace the water with scintillator. The scintillator, scintillator is lighter, so you, it, 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 uh, it floats. And then you displace it, and you empty the water from the bottom. And again, nice pictures. And eventually, in 2007, we were filled. Um, with arguably the purest from radioactivity condensed thing in the universe, probably, uh, or until otherwise proven. And our program was mainly to target the beryllium-7 uh, flux. We knew that we would have, we would see the boron-8, because this was, had been seen already by other experiments, and we could do the math of the cross-section. Everything else from yellow to sort of orangey was, well, we think we can probably maybe say something about it, but who knows what. Um, this was, we would see. I mean, if a star exploded close enough, we would definitely see it, but uh, we'll see if it, if it will happen. And then, of course, the SOX project came afterwards, so this was not part of the original plan of Barixino. And there's a lot of reasons to study neutrinos from the sun, as I said. There's a lot of non-standard physics that one can try and study in this transition uh, uh, transformation. We know uh, data here. We have data here. The in-between is not mapped as well. And there's exotic scenarios by which interesting things could happen if you could precisely do a me measurement in between. This is really hard, but by the way, to do it. And then you can study the sun. And you can study the sun in their fluxes. And uh, various neutrinos are not produced exactly in the same positions in the sun. I'm not a particular expert. But basically, by precision me 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 measurements of the fluxes, you can actually say something about the sun. And this is what we have done from 2007 till today. Phase one lasted three years. Then we re-purified the scintillator for a couple of years. Uh, then we ran phase two. Um, some, some people include 2010 into phase two. This is a matter of taste. And what we did in phase one was to measure the beryllium-7, measure the boron-8, measure the PEP flux for the first time with some large uncertainty, and place the most stringent of constraints on the CNO. And then we actually did succeed in seeing the, the, the anti-neutrinos produced from radioactivity in the, in the Earth's uh, crust, for the most part. The purification has yielded purification on, in Krypton-85, some purification in B B bismuth-210. I'll say more about this. Um, kind of skipping. But remember the 10 to the minus 16 uh, uh, uranium and thorium I said from the CTF? Well, now we are here. High, mid, mid to high, no, 10 to the minus 19 grams per gram. This is one part in one 19 O's by mass of these elements. Um, and these are limits, because at some point, our detector is not big enough to actually count it precisely because the number of events is too small. Um, and then in phase two, we actually went beyond the original plan. And, and uh, I would say that the probably the mediatic biggest success was the measurement of the PP flux. Uh, Bartino had studied what it would look like. We had never re really promised that we could do it. And we could actually do it quite well. 
and then we actually we also improved on it uh, this year. We improved on the G neutrinos, we improved on um, all the other fluxes, and then we did some other studies of, of, of more exotic things, uh, one of which I have a couple of slides on is the looking for neutrinos in coincidence with the gravitational uh, signals that were detected not so long ago. Um, we kind of had to do that. Uh, so, um, yeah. sorry about that. So, going back, what did the spectrum of the recoiling electrons look like in, in our experiment? So we expected it to look like this. Carbon-14 is a beta decay with a low Q energy, predominant, okay, there's a lot of it. This is a large scale. The beryllium-7, remember, are of a given energy. So if you, if you scatter off an electron, the, the spectrum of scattered electron has a, a typical Compton edge, like photons do. If the neutrino has one, a given energy, this is what you would see. Then we knew that we would have some cosmic activated uh, carbon-11. We didn't quite know how much. We thought we knew, then it was a little more than we thought. Um, and then here you see, for example, the PP and the CNO are suppressed, another factor of 10. Uh, so this is just the signal with the background only from the intrinsic scintillator, not, no impurities. Well, how close did we get? Well, but before going close, this is really what we expected. All the signals plus the backgrounds, polonium-210, bismuth-210, krypton-85, and so on. So we knew that we had to deal with all these, and that's how we designed the specs of the experiment. So, with a couple of weeks of data, this is what we saw. So remember, this is what we were hoping to see. So we opened the box, and the entire uh, 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 300 tons of scintillator, normalized to 100, just to compare it, showed the carbon-14 very prominently. We knew that was it. It showed a bump that we, we understood after. And then it, there was this really uninteresting splur of, of things. But remember, this is the whole 300 tons. So it gets all the non-shielded gamma rays. That's why we need to do a fiducial cut. Once we do that fiducial cut, you lose two-thirds of your mass, but you gain in signal to, to noise. Why? Well, this, with just that cut, and really, it's nothing more than that cut. This is what we saw. Now, the plot is made to scale correctly, but carbon-14 is still there, so if you cut it, it's still there, okay, because it's intrinsic. This bump now appeared like an alpha peak that we know being to be polonium-210, the nemesis of today's low background experiments for, that, for a large part. We see the bump of C11, interestingly, but we saw the shoulder. <laughs> Two weeks of data. This is the 10 to the minus uh, negative 20 uh, or thorium degree. This is the well, this was 10 to the, at, in phase one, it was like 10 to the minus 16, 17. So this is phase one. This is phase, phase one. This is the data from phase one. And we published actually, I think, in five weeks. We also had delays of the experiment, so we really had to publish quickly to, to regain PR. But seeing this was like a big relief. Uh, and then we did other things. We, we did uh, discrimination of alpha events and beta events in the scintillator by pulse shape discrimination. Uh, it turns out the alpha events have a, a long scintillation tail that you can really separate in our scintillator extremely well. And doing that, everything goes away. Uh, I mean, the alpha goes away, but the beta-like things stay as, it, as they should. And of course, this was somewhat fine-tuned, but the separation is actually quite remarkable. Um, and so basically, this was it. So we published the Balaam 7. We published a paper on cosmic ray production of uh, isotopes in the scintillator. Um, and we published a limit on, well, I'll say something about this. So this is the actual published number from phase one. We have a rate with some uncertainty. Um, then we take these beryllium-7 events and s try to see if there's any day-night effect. In neutrino physics, you want to see whether this mass effect that's prominent in the sun happens in the Earth as well, as neutrinos at night have to cross the Earth to reach your detector. Uh, and, and in the day, they don't have to. Um, and we didn't see any effect. Now, you might be puzzled by this uh, negative peak. We define rate at night minus rate at day. This is how we defined it. And
And the rate in the day has more polonium. This is the alpha peak of polonium. And you say, well, why is polonium decaying more? You know, why, why is the polonium decaying more in the day than at night? Well, it turns out that this is just an artifact of the fact that hum humans are awake in the day. And so most likely you do detector purifications in the day. So you move the scintillator in the day. And that's when you bring in a little bit more polonium. And then some of it, you know, so you have, anyway, it's, 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 it's an artifact of the fact that you do operations in the day instead of at night. But then you can do more, a more refined, and, 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 and that's what we actually published here, where you look for a beryllium-7 type spectrum emerging from the asymmetry between day and night. These are beryllium-7, so we know their energy. If there's more at night of, an, of electron flavor than in the day, we should see an actual spectral uh, shape, not just a rate. And that's what we, we did. And when you do that, you, you really don't see anything there. And then you set the limit with no day-night effect, at the energy of the beryllium-7. And this is, again, a little bit academic. I mean, neutrino oscillations were resolved by then. So the LNA solution between you know, Snow and uh, all the other experiments was, was understood, and CAM1. Uh, however, our experiment alone with the day-night was able to basically go back to that. So it was nice to see that with one compact experiment, you'd actually uh, do physics, which is self-contained. The systematics uh, are, 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 very, very, are very suppressed. So going back to our you know, uh, model plot, uh, the questions were then, well, can we do anything about these, these fluxes? Can we do anything about the bolonate flux? And can we do anything about PP? We got ambitious. You know, at this point, we did this. So we said, OK, collecting more data would make it more precise. And we knew that we would do that. But we wanted to do more than that. And so, again, this slide summarizes why uh, it's important. Now, the PP neutrinos are important from a practical standpoint because you have a very firm expectation of their rate. Uh, because the PP, essentially, the sun shines with the PP fusion. And so, imposing, say, equilibrium of the sun and equilibrium between the neutrino production and the photon that we see, um, uh, we can. Uh, uh, we can really constrain the PP flux. And then the PP just follows suit because it's the same reaction, except sometimes it happens with the fusion of an electron in the initial state. The CNO is a completely free parameter because it being such a small f fraction of the energy in the sun, it's really not constrained by theory at all. So you know, it's important. We knew it was in, uh, a, you know, a good thing to look, like, to look at. However, you can see how this C11 really gets in the way. So carbon-11 is produced by cosmic uh, muons hitting carbon-12 by spiration of sorts. And that can happen in a number of processes that we studied. A carbon-11 is produced. This lives a half hour. So the muon rate at Grand Sass is low, but it's high enough that you cannot veto the detector after every one of these muons for a couple of hours, because you would always be dead. And so you have to be smarter than that. You know that some of these are floating around. And this is a beta plus emitter, as, as we saw from the, from the spectrum of the carbon-11. That is a background for CNO and PEP. However, C11 is produced most of the times with the emission of a neutron in the final state. And that thermalizes and then wanders around in a random walk for a good fraction of a millisecond, which is a very long time for us to observe. And, uh, and then it captures mostly on protons, sometimes on the, car the carbon. And the capture process is such that it produces a, a gamma ray, so another flash with a delay. So by, by, by looking at the triple coincidence of a muon followed by some beta-like event some half hour after that, uh, uh, and but preceded by this capture, you could sort of statistically tag this class of events. And then we would do it tracking around the muon and with a sphere around the capture of neutrons and so on. And so this is what we were able to do. This is a carbon-11 background. And applying that threefold coincidence, of course, you can tweak the parameters to make it better or worse in suppressing the background. However, you have to stop when the lifetime you're cutting is too, is too large. You know if you veto for an infinite time, you won't have any background. 
but you won't have any data either. So you, know, so you, have, to, you have to pick your fights. And so you have to pick uh, the radius of these cuts and the time of these cuts. And so we settled on throwing away half the events, <laughs> but we're you know, subtracting almost 90% or more, more than, not, 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 uh, uh, suppressing the background by a factor of 10, so keeping 90% of the, uh, throwing away half, 90% of the background. <laughs> There's interesting physics. Uh, this three-fold coincidence is actually very sophisticated and it got better with time. When a positron is emitted, we call it a beta event, and in this energy spectrum we show it as a beta event. However, a positron thermalizes, then captures, positronium is formed, that lives, three quarters of the time, nanoseconds, which is a short time, but it's, it's long enough for our PMTs to, to disentangle it from the scintillation pulse. And so by applying a, a pulse shape the discrimination we're able to actually distinguish with some ability positron events from ele the electron events in the scintillator. This is something we didn't know we would be able to do. This came by looking at the pulse shape and then I remember someone, one of the students showed a plot and at some point there was a jump, a small jump, but a jump. And then we're like, wait a minute, you can do it. And so then it took another two years to refine the technique, but uh, uh, this is what we did. And so we developed a pulse shape parameter that for positron had this bump for electrons is all here. And so you have some ability to distinguish. And so you put it in the mix and you suppress the background a little more. And you save a little bit of lifetime in doing so. Now, of course, carbon 10, which is produced often with the emission of neutrons, um, of two of them in the final state, is very prominently vetoed because you have all these cap captures you can veto against. Yes, the BDT is applied and it automatically gets rid of car carbon-10, which is at higher energy as well. But it's easier. And carbon-10 only has a half-life of half a minute. No, of, yeah, half a minute, which is much less. So you could, in principle, veto specifically for that much better. Half hour is too long. Maybe, a, actually, a snow lab, it's not. A snow lab, you have a new one and you veto for three hours and you're done. Then you get ambitious and you recover that data because it, you, know, you have a student who does the analysis as well, but, but you can still do physics with just a brutal cut. However, the, the spectra of PEP and CNO are so similar, even after the subtraction, that we could only do a joint analysis of the two. They're correlated enough that if you put flux in one, you eliminate it from the other. And basically, what it boils down to is measuring the height of the valley which is the sum of the two, and as how high you make the, va the valley will tell you the sum, not that's plus the background. But, and so we did a, 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 an analysis together, and we claimed a flux for the PP with a large error of about 20%, and the, the best uh, constraint on CNO. It's the best constraint on CNO so far, or it was, but it's not good enough to discriminate the models of the sun, which are all, which all predict the flux, which is actually smaller still. So, so it's interesting from the technology point of view, not from the physics yet. Of course, we calibrated. So at the end of phase one, we calibrated the detector with vials of scintillator spiked with sources, a neutron source, an insertion system, which was flashed for radon. We did all these sources at a variety of energies, from low energy to high energy to neutrons to alphas. And we sampled all these points. I won't, I won't go through all of them, but we had this rod, which had a hinge, and the source at the end, the source at the end had a, a lead, so you could take pictures of it without turning the lights on. The, this picture was taken for the sake of, of talking to you guys. But the PMTs and the, uh, actually the cameras alone could triangulate on the position. And we could reconstruct the position of the source to about a centimeter in, at, at the end. We could really do a, a very good job. And so we calibrated like the detector. We saw all these gamma peaks and calibrated the energy scale very well. We calibrated all sorts of radial dependencies. You lose a little bit of light as you go from the center of the detector where it's, everything is nice and mesotropic to the edges where you have a little bit of, of optics of the, of the balloons which are not flat spheres, they're a little bit scalloped. They have, you, know, you lose 
just a tiny bit of light on, on the edges, and we measured all this. So we could, of course, then go back and recorrect a lot of the data and, and get better uh, estimates of uh, neutrino fluxes. So we calibrated the position reconstruction and the energy reconstruction. And this was phase one. Again, I, I restate uh, our, our measurement uh, flagship uh, back, back then, uh, which is the beryllium-7 measurement to um, 5%, which started to be better than the constraint from theory. So that was the goal of the experiment, to measure the beryllium-7 flux better than constraints from solar physics. So that you could start tell the theorists that they could use the number as an input and say, and constrain everything else. So this is, again, is a, is a, is a summary of what we did. Um, then we purified the scintillator. We did water extraction that I explained early in a continuous loop. We would take scintillator out the bottom and send it back up. And here I show one of the successes. We had some failures too, but uh, mostly successes. Krypton was suppressed, as I mentioned. Uranium and thorium was uh, suppressed to uh, you know, uh, un unattainable uh, concentrations. Business 210 went up the first couple of cycles and then it went back down. We had to tune the water extraction process in order to, to reduce the lead 210, which is the, the parent of this. And polonium was a modest success. It only decreased by a factor of a few. Um, uh, and, and this is still something that we know at this point requires a specific intervention if you want to eliminate that. But let me just throw a number at you. Radon-222. Radon-222 in this room, in the air, is at the level of 10 becquerel a meter cube. A meter cube is about a kilogram of air. And so this is about a, a becquerel, or 10 becquerel a kilogram, in nature. We breathe it, we live with it for an extended time. We got it to less than a count per year per 100 tons. If you convert that in units of becquerel per kilo, I did it on the plane today, 3 10 to the minus 7 micro becquerels per kilo. Less than a count in 100 tons, so you wait a long time. You want statistics on this? You have to measure for two decades. In the 100 tons, there's more close to the vessels because it diffuses, but slowly, and then it decays. So if the fluid is stable, the radon stays where it is. It moves not much. Phase two, first success was the measurement of the PP flux. This made uh, nature, so that may, meant it made the press. Uh, I got interviewed by the New York Times and all of this time. It was perfect, it was my, the year I got tenure, so it couldn't have happened at the better time <laughs> to be on the newspapers. But it wasn't me, just, just me. My student did a lot of the work, but it was the whole collaboration, obviously. Um, and again, this was a huge success of the purity of the techniques used to get here. In terms of uh, impact on particle physics, I would say that the beryllium-7 was superior to this because this was expected. The precision of this was not at the, pre the precision of the theoretical expectations from the sun. But this was a huge success in terms of being able to even do it. Um, and so we were able to probe experimentally the equ equilibrium of the sun on a scale of 10 to hundreds of thousands of years, which is the time it takes for the energy producing the core in those fusion processes to get to the edge and then, then, then be emitted in yellow light that we see and UV light and other things on the surface. But that's old, old light. It's degraded light. It's not the, ga the gamma energy at the core. It probes directly the fundamental process that fuels the sun. So it has obviously an appeal uh, to have been able to do this. The challenges, of course, of the, of the measurements, because PP is so low energy, is C14. But not C14 itself. We know C14, we measured it so well, the statistics is so high that we know how to measure it. And we know the beta spectrum of C14 extremely well. So that, that was not the issue. This not only is the tr sets the trigger rate of the experiment at a few tens of hertz in the entire 300 tons, but for the PP measurement, the pileup of two carbon-14 events happening randomly at the same time in the detector was the problem. And I'll show why that was the problem. 
The problem is that this is C14 that you can fit extremely well. This is the polonium peak with the alpha peak that again is, is Gaussian, we, we understand extremely well. PP is this, expected PP is this red line. Actually, this is the best fit. So it's actually from, from data. And so our sensitivity to PP was the deformation of the energy spectrum here. The fit followed what happened there. If you didn't include anything, the fit would really be a bad fit. The chi-square or the likelihood of the fit was awful because of these points. But what, the, the, what these points were, you know, we were hoping they were PP, and we, I think now we're confident that some of it, it, uh, it was PP. You know, everything else except one thing is pretty flat. So you, you, know, you can have a constant of the combination of all the other fluxes that it's just a constant, and it's fine. Uh, but the pileup, uh, so my student Keith Otis, in fact, had a clever, uh, developed a, a, a clever thing that was not only his idea, it was the idea of a, a, a few in the collaboration. And that was, how do you study the pileup? How do you know you have pileup? You can't reconstruct, at these low energies, it's very hard to reconstruct the positions. You lose a lot of, grand, you know, of, 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 of sharpness in, in, how, in how you do that. And he used a data-driven technique that is valid for low event rate um, processes in the detector. So when you have an event that you open a gate for a certain amount of time, okay, and then you have you know, whatever the pulse, and then you have some spurious after pulsing possibly, and then maybe uh, uh, after a long time, these are events that are like having snapshots of the detector at random. And so basically, to make a long uh, 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 story uh, uh, simple, he basically used real triggers of all events, sliced them up, and then folded over these slices to the beginning of the trigger. And that would enhance, in a triggerless way, whatever is contained here. And based on how many times you overlap slices of these data, you know how much you're enhancing the random sample compared to the triggered sample. So you can factor that in. And what he got was this shape. This is simul no, it's a, well, he got it from simulation and from the data, and that's why it's jagged, because we're limited by statistics eventually. But basically, this was the shape of the C14 pileup in the detector that had to be added as a fit parameter to the fit. So this was a very difficult analysis to do. Difficult analysis also to really convince yourself is correct, <laughs> because, you know, eh, there's no feature there. It's like, eh. But then you try the fit, you try all sorts of stability plots, you change the parameters over a large range, and the fit always pegs at the same number, then, then you start to gain confidence. And then if you plot it on this survival plot, both seen you know, only date data at that point are like this. So by eye, you can kind of see a step, but obviously the statistical significance is still not a five sigma discovery that the LHC would need to discover a particle. But you know, neutrinos are hard. It's hard to have statistics. So you know, even having this is, 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 is a milestone. And so you know, we were able to, to claim some evidence of this MSW transition. We got whatever recognition. And um, this is an interesting uh, report uh, by Rick uh, and George uh, Cowan uh, from 1982 uh, uh, making this argument about the stability of the sun in neutrinos and in light a long time before any of this was measured in neutrinos. So I, I suggest this as a good read. Then let me, uh, I, don't know how, I don't know when I started, so you, you tell me how much to go on today and then I'll, okay. Um, so in these 10 minutes, let me, let me segue into the newest data. But before I do that, let me tell you a few other things we do. Uh, we measure the muons extremely well. Uh, this is our data as a function of, of season. This is for three years. And we actually do see the expected fluctuation of the muon flux with a maximum with a maximum in the summer and a minimum in, in the winter, and this is is a known effect that's due to the fact that in the summer the atmosphere um, expands and it's thicker, and so you actually produce some more uh, flux. But we actually see it, so this is a this is a good uh, 
is a good thing. We measure its phase and, 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 and amplitude. Another thing that is seasonal, obviously, is the solar flux. And the, then uh, we take our more, most abundant and more, most precisely estimated of the fluxes, the beryllium-7 flux. So far, we have not had the certainty that these were, the direct evidence that these were from the sun. I mean, they were from the sun because they matched a beautiful expectation and it matches so well that you know, it's hard to not believe it. And then it masked all the oscillation uh, things that we knew. However, um, we eventually had enough data to time bin the measurement of the beryllium-7 flux. Now, of course, it's hard because now you're slicing the data, and so each bin has to have enough statistics to be meaningful in a, in a, in a time fit. And the expectation is that because the orbit of the Earth is not exactly a circle, it's not really even that much of an ellipse. But there is a little bit of an effect that it's a few percent modulation of the neutrino flux by solid angle. Now, of course, should the oscillation have been this vacuum oscillation that was really fine-tuned to the distance sun to Earth, there could have been a much bigger effect. But now we know that that is not the case, that the neutrino flavor mix is as it emerges from, from the sun. And so that change doesn't really affect the composition on Earth. And so we do this, and we looked at the time series in a number of ways. The most easy to explain is just the time fit. It's actually the least sensitive of the techniques, but it, it, you, know, you can follow the eye. Now, the eye follows the red line. Uh, it should be shown without the fit and then with the fit. But then we do Fourier type analyses and we f show peaks at one year. Uh, and, and so we do, we do it all, and, so, and there's a paper. And, and now we have very good confidence that those neutrinos are, are actually from the sun, or are compatible with the modulation with the distance between the sun and the earth, which makes it an extremely nice textbook kind of thing to, you know, to, to just uh, consolidate the measurement. And then let me introduce phase two, which we'll complete tomorrow. Um, we got much better into analysis as well as time went on because every new student is smarter than the previous one and it, uh, some of it re is resulting in better analyses. Some analysis is actually forgotten sometimes. So there's, there's two lessons to be learned. Um, that some analysis that work beautifully, no, nobody continues or picks up and then nobody remembers how to do it because that student has moved on to something else. The palladium had decayed away. We, remember, we didn't do any operations at that point for, for a long time. And so you know, we see a, decay, a, a major decay of the polonium. And this is the effect of the purification, the bismuth purification. The bismuth is a, a beta that has a spectrum that looks like this. And so we did see a little bit of a suppression, not as much as we would have hoped. There's, here are details of the analysis. I really don't want to go much into this. There's, there's, there's papers which describe and use these analyses. But basically, we do fits both with spectral fits from an analytical spect spectrum and from spectra generated by simulation. And we do both. And we make sure this is basically an evaluation of you know, once you start doing measurements at a few percent, you want to do measurements in various ways. And the discrepancies you don't understand are are an error that you include in, the, in, in how well you understand how, uh, how you do things, how you understand your energy, your position, your correlation between components, your shapes of the PDFs that you put in the, in the, in the spectral fit. And so um, uh, we, you know, we were able to use a multivariate uh, uh, technique and, uh, to do fits, and there's various uh, factors to this that represents various pieces of the, of the fit, threefold coincidence for the C11, um, uh, E plus, E minus discrimination, how well we really understand the radial distribution of events that include gamma rays, events from gamma rays from the periphery of the, of the experiment. There's a lot to say about this. I don't really have time. These are the gamma rays from the outside. So we actually measured it, putting sources in the buffers and measuring uh, their attenuation into the, into the fiducial part of the scintillator. Uh, and here again, this is with the suppression of this threefold coincidence. And if you really squint, you start seeing a little bit of a knee here. 
Now, this is polished. This is after a lot, a lot of work. And this is where we published basically the evidence that the PP indeed has this Compton edge, which is pleasing. It's a neutrino flux with a given energy, and you, you know, it's not as beautiful as the beryllium 7. It's a little higher energy, but this is suppressed by a factor of 10 in, in flux. So this is a rate that's really, really, really low. And again, uh, the analysis is robust enough that we can actually claim a bigger than five sigma effect on measuring the PEP. So this is a, a, an observation, a measurement of it. It's not just an evidence, it's more than an evidence, that's what I meant to see. And then the other thing we were able to do finally was to do a global fit over the entire energy spectrum uh, up, to, uh, uh, up, to, up, up to here of all the components at the same time. In phase one, we did beryllium 7, PP. Well, PP was phase two already, but the PP, we sort of sliced that part of the energy spectrum. And that's because uh, there's subtle effects, but at low energy, the best energy, the, the best way to measure the energy is just count the number of hit PMTs. Because the probability that you get two photons on the same tube are so low that that really allows you to do a counting experiment, which is, is easy in, in a way. You don't have to calibrate the amplitude of that pulse. Well, you, you do, but anyway, it, it, in simplistic terms, you, 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 you don't have to. As you go higher in energy, you start to have to include double hits. And so you can't just count the number of hit PMTs. You have to calibrate the energy exactly. And how you calibrate at this energy and down at that energy has discrepancies at the level of the systematic errors that you're trying to improve to first order. So you really have to work extremely hard and that's where simulations come in. You start simulating uh, all the dead tubes. Tubes are dying as we go and there's an asymmetry in how they die. So you have this mass simulation that tells you tube number 47 has died and so on and you have simulated runs run per run and then you put it all together and that takes a huge amount of time and a huge amount of checking, and that's why it took a long time to, to get here. And it's only when we had to really improve the measurements of all of these fluxes to an uncertainty for which we really had to do this that we started really doing it, uh, for, you know, obviously. How often did Well, we lost quite a few. So originally there are 2,200 installed, but we now have more than 2,000 working. <laughs> <laughs> there was a, 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 a first day effect or a minus three day effect to that wipe them out. Um, I would say we lose a tube a week, roughly. So it's a, you know, we still have plenty, but our, I think our low energy days are close to over. Uh, so we did the, the simultaneous fit, which is, uh, you can find in this, in this archive. We're preparing a paper actually off this archive. And, uh, and again, we get beta ber ber beryllium 7 because the krypton is, uh, is, is suppressed. We get uh, beta PP uh, a little bit. And we, 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 we discover the PP, as I showed. And we get, got a better uh, measurement of the uh, CNO. And then here is just a table of the backgrounds that we measure in the, in the, in the global fit. I don't want to go into the numbers, but uh, this is what we have uh, for um, uh, reference. And let me conclude with the other uh, thing that we weren't able to include, but this is for a reason, into the global fit. So, so the global fit that I've shown up to the PEP and CNO does a fiducial cut. So we still do the standard fiducial cut because we need the events are low energy enough that we really need the purity of the central part of the scintillator. For the boronate uh, neutrinos, on the other hand, most of it is above 3 MeV. And the, lar the largest single gamma ray in nature, in natural radioactivity, I should say, is 2.6 MeV. And so for this, um, this study, we did a study with two thresholds, 3 and 5 MeVs, that used the entirety of the 300 tons. But then it couldn't be stitched to the global fit. You, know, you, you really have to model the detector with its backgrounds. Uh, it's a different experiment almost. And, and so for Bornate, 
uh, that enhanced the, um, the, the signal. Our detector is rather small. It's a third of snow. And compared to Super-K, it's, it's, it's really tiny. Um, but we're still able to do a fit between 3.2 and 17 uh, MEVs. Uh, in the entire 300 tons, kind of, we, we cut off the two poles. Uh, and I'll say why tomorrow. Uh, and basically, we do a radial fit with all the radial components, including the backgrounds from the vessel and the gamma rays from the outside uh, sneaking in. And there is a component of neutron captures, and neutrons produced on the outside can trickle in further than the gamma rays because they can travel further. And there's actually a subtlety. You see how thallium-208, which is the 2.6 MeV um, photon, but then if you take the entire decay, it, it has a 5 MeV Q energy, so you can get some of the energy if you get far away enough uh, of that 5 MeVs. There's a surface activity, which is com compatible radially, and you can simulate this, with radioactivity in the vessel, at the vessel, at the, this nylon balloon. But then there's a component that is slightly shift, it's shifted. It seems like a small effect, but if you don't include this, the chi-square here really is hard, to, is hard to fit, which is compatible with radon-220 emanation from the vessel that goes, you know, centimeters away from the vessel. And now you get the entire decay energy because nothing is absorbed by the passive uh, balloon. And those of you who've, who work and deal with surface contamination will understand exactly the importance of all of this. Um, on the other hand, above 5 MeVs, which is above the Q energy of thallium, you just do a spectral fit with two things, gamma rays and, 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 and B8. And then you extract the B8, <laughs> very simplistically. And now finally, after a long time, we have enough statistics to do this. Uh, Super-K would have done this in much less time and has done this in much less time. So this is kind of how we split our energy spectrum. This is the acceptance, just to show that we did things correctly. This is the neutrino energy spectrum, and the blue and the red are what you actually sample when you do these cuts on the recoil electron energy. You're really still sampling the high energy part of the B8 spectrum. So when one says we, did, we measure the Born-8 spectrum to low threshold, it's misleading because the low threshold is on the scattered electron, which is still dominated by high energy events. So this is something to keep in mind. And so the mean energies are 8 MeV and 10 MeV. So there's still the high energy part of the spectrum, which is nothing uh, particularly new. Um, and again, these are the, ex the backgrounds from the outside. And here, this is a slide explaining that I'm happy to leave behind this emanation thing that I, 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 I mentioned. So the results are, with you know, some, some parameters of this run about you know, active mass and so on and so forth, um, we uh, measure it in the low energy threshold and higher energy thre threshold. They're compatible. They're not identical, obviously. And then if you combine the two analyses, you get 0.22 counts per day per 100 tons, which uh, compares uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Super-K and our previous uh, uh, estimate we reduce the R error by a factor of two. So this is, you know, and this took many years. Unfortunately, this is just st uh, statistics. Um, so this is a summary of phase two. This done together, and this done on its own. Comparing the, the systematic uncertainties now and statistical uh, with what we had prior, and you see that each one of these channels is, is measured. And the Brigham 7, actually, this is in the wrong line. It should be here. The beryllium-7 now is measured to better than 3%, which is twice as small than the theoretical error we started from. It took 20 years, but now we can say we understand the sun in this aspect better than we ever have. So let me leave it here. Tomorrow I'll be talking about metallicity and CNO and a few other things about uh, what we have and will do. So thank you for now. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a very nice talk. And considering the plane landed just three hours ago, so that's... Uh, <laughs> uh, this was finished on the plane. <laughs> uh, so we open the floor for questions. Well, 
while somebody wants. I, I, I have a, a few questions. 64. Oh. Uh, I have a question about the PP. Yes. Um, so, I mean, as you said, you, uh, there is a flux that you have to get from, from some model, from Bacal or whoever, and, and then you, you draw your conclusion. Now, there is, a, there is a paper on the archive that claims that you can turn things around, and not from the Borexino uh, collaboration, but using the Borexino data. And instead of using the calculated cross-section and flux to draw conclusions on the neutrino, he wants to take the flux and the measurement to measure sine squared theta w. Yes. To, uh, yes. I was, comment on that? I was alerted. So uh, I'm happy to talk about this paper specifically, uh, either offline or tomorrow. Um, uh, this is something that we have we have actually talked about it within the collaboration uh, uh, when when that paper came out. So that paper, I think the idea is correct. I mean, the, the idea is perfectly fine. I mean, you, you start from, from data, and you forget as much as you can about predictions, and you see what that data is telling you within some context, of course. And of course, the weak interaction is, is, a, is, a, is an obvious target of neutrinos, which are such a beautiful probe, very pure. Uh, they're hard to detect, but once you detect them, they're very clean. Um, that particular paper, we actually wrote to the authors, uh, offline. We didn't send a rebuttal. We did it in a friendly way. So they took our numbers, you know, our summary numbers, and you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, our fluxes at given energies, and uh, to extract this information. Um, in reality, it's not as simple as that, because really, what you should, you should also include the correlations in the fit when you extract these. And that was not done, obviously. I mean, they, they didn't have that information. But if you do that, our preliminary sort of estimates in, internally are that the constraints are much worse. <laughs> so the principle still stands as valid. Practically, I don't think you get anything quite interesting yet because your uncertainties are actually larger than claimed in that paper, we but think. A good factor of two. Thank you. But I think it's it, it's it, it's a great point. I mean, how do could we do this much better with a much bigger experiment, for example? Then certainly you could go into the precision electro weak physics. That would be fantastic at these low energies. I mean, this would be unprecedented. Yeah. And do I understand correctly for that idea that for specifically for the PP neutrinos? the flux prediction is simply much better than for any of the others and that's why and, and, and depends less on the oscillation parameter and be it's because of that that you can draw conclusions on the weak mixing angle? Uh, in principle they're all correlated. But they're all correlated. The PP flux is constrained strongly by the fact that we know the sun is in equilibrium <laughs> and we know how much light is produced by the sun. Um, People have started with more data coming in, starting to relax that luminosity constraint, which is, is what is giving you the 1% theoretically. And then the theoretical uncertainty becomes larger, of course. Uh, and, 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 then, and then you do a little bit of, of what you said. You, you have some data-driven approach that feeds into a model that doesn't have to require that equilibrium. That, I mean, I don't think anybody doubts it, given the fact that we see stars all over that look like the sun at different phases of their age, and we can say that the sun is probably no different. But, <laughs> but I think these are all interesting things. I mean, these are basic questions of looking up in the sky and seeing why is the sun the way it is. I mean, I think it's a very fundamental questions of of of, of humankind. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? So I have a few, but I'm not just going to say one uh, to ask one. Uh, probably to the general interest. So, so you say uh, with the PMTs that are, are uh, dying, you're, so you are the, the low energy is just basically slowly going down. But yeah. uh, you are also improving the purification. So, 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 uh, so you are exploring to, to uh, get better on, on, on this. Uh, Possibly. With, uh, this depends a little bit on interaction. So let me anticipate a few things. So we have this SOX run, which is, I'll, I'll show a few things tomorrow in detail, but I'll, I'll, I'll say it now as well. 
is the idea of probing these anomalies of neutrino oscillations into possibly sterile sector, a sterile sector that started from the LSMD anomaly, and then there was uh, the gallium calibration anomaly that, by the way, was never claimed by anyone on the Galax experiment. It was claimed from outside taking their data. Um, reactor anomaly in the total nor in the normalization of the reactor flux. Anyway, the idea is to take a neutrino source, in fact, an anti-neutrino uh, uh, source, and put it right under the detector. There is actually a tunnel, uh, and this is possible. And we, we, the plan, okay, the contract is to receive a 150 kilo curie source, kilo curie. 37 Becquerel is a nano curie, so you can do the math. Um, from a reactor in Russia that separates a cerium 144 and makes it into the source. Then it's shipped to France. France imports it and it will come to Grand Sasso. And this should happen next spring. And then uh, the idea is to have this source that decays over about a year and a half, and then it's sort of spent, and then you, you take it out because it's spent and measure oscillations at the meter scale, which corresponds to about one EV squared, which is, is roughly where the anomalies are. Although the anomalies have been mitigated with recent diabay numbers, and, and so anyway, whether what one believes or not in sterile neutrinos, this is, that it is an experiment that can be done, and we know how to do it, so. But there's an interference with the solar program. So I'll say tomorrow that now we're in a condition where the detector is at of a stability like never before. Thermal stability. That means that the background is not mixing up anymore. So the CNO, we have never been able to do it yet because background was set, sort of set up. And so even a fiducial cut didn't, we saw background moving from the bottom to the top and then back to the bottom. I'll show plots of this. Now we've thermally insulated the detector, and so we have had a period of months where it's thermally stable and layered, and so there's no convective movement. However, the SOX program uh, needs sources to be inserted to calibrate it prior to the, to the SOX run, for two reasons. One is to calibrate the detector before the source arrives so you can publish quickly. But this is the weakest of the arguments because since we, we don't have competition directly on SOX. There's reactor experiments, but not directly on the SOX idea. Uh, but the other one is that they, there's a new trigger being implemented to use the entire 300 tons for SOX that requires sources being inserted and probed and probing the very periphery of the detector to set the parameters of this trigger. If you don't set the trigger, you lose the events and, and, and you don't do that part, part of the science. And I can guarantee you that at the levels of counts of bismuth 210 and lead 210 that we have, 10, 20 counts per day per 100 tons, this is not a lot of radioactivity. I mean, for us, it's like a large background. But <laughs> in, in layman's term, this is, this is nothing. Even these rods that we will clean and so on and so forth will most likely, A, stir the scintillator up, probably a little bit, B, introduce some amount of radioactivity. And at that point, CNO is gone, I think. This is my per personal opinion, so don't quote me as a bored CNO line. Ideally, SOX for a solar program to be fully successful sh should be delayed six months. But if the source arrives, it arrives, then it starts to decay. So who knows? Um, I say who knows because, yes, the contract says something, but if you, if you Google Grand SOX or SOX, and you can do it, you know, it's, it's nothing secret. Um, we can have a chat of what you see tomorrow. Okay, uh, let's uh, thank uh, our speaker again. We have a, a 15 minute, minute uh, break, right? And uh, we will come back for the last session of the day.